December 17, 1944. The German offensive was 24 hours old as Hitler's panzers continued to make deep penetrations at the center of the American line. By now, the enemy thrust had driven a sharp wedge into Belgium. It would be known through history as the Bulge. Recognizing the strength and scope of the enemy offensive, General Omar Bradley, the Allied ground commander, began moving reserve units toward the Ardennes front. The combat-tested 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions were motor convoy toward Bastogne. From the north, the American 7th Armored Division was ordered to saint vith where the Germans were poised to attack. Just as German tanks and infantry began their assault against the vital road junction, 7th Armored Tanks rolled into saint vith the fighting was brutal, but the American lines grimly held. The German thrust was blunted. The complexion of the battle began to change. On December 19th, Generals Eisenhower, Bradley and Patton held an emergency meeting at Verdun. A battle plan was agreed upon. saint vith and Bastogne must hold the Germans must not be allowed to reach the Meurs. Even as the battle orders flowed forth from Verdun, cracked German airborne units were dropping behind the Allied lines. English-speaking enemy soldiers wearing U.S. uniforms infiltrated the rear, misdirecting traffic bound for the front. For days, they created panic and confusion. On the afternoon of December 19th, units of the 101st Airborne Division arrived in Bastogne. They quickly dug in and prepared for the inevitable attack. Within hours, German armor had surrounded the city. Sensing victory, Adolf Hitler hastened to meet with his commanders. He would demand that Bastogne be taken, whatever the cost. In the Ardennes, tanks of the 5th Panzer Army moved forward. There was no American armor to oppose them. To the north, a German SS unit marched more than a hundred American POWs into a Belgian field and machine-gunned them to death. Only a handful survived to tell the grim story. News of the outrage infuriated the GIs. The atrocity seemed only to strengthen their resolve. The SS unit was later annihilated just miles from its Meurs River goal. By December 20th, the southern advance of the German 7th Army had been stopped. Hitler's offensive was being delayed by small, hard-fighting American units. Then, on December 21st, the American defenders of saint vith were ordered to abandon the city. German commanders rejoiced at the news. Once again, Hitler ordered that Bastogne be taken. As December 23rd dawned, the fate of Bastogne hung in the balance. Since the outset of the battle, snow and fog had made Allied air support impossible. Now the skies suddenly cleared. Planes of the U.S. 9th Air Force began to pound the columns of German armor that jammed all roads leading to the front. During the next five days, they flew more than 10,000 sorties, seeking out and reporting enemy troop movements and strafing trains carrying badly needed supplies to the forward panzer units. To the south, in the region of the Saar, General Patton had turned his tank columns northward toward the beleaguered Bastogne. Ever impatient, Patton hoped to relieve the city with one dramatic sweep of his beloved armor. But treacherous road conditions made for slow going. The fighting at Bastogne had begun. Units of the 101st Airborne and 10th Armored Divisions repelled attack after attack. When the enemy commander demanded the city surrender, Brigadier General Anthony McAuliffe's reply was, nuts. An 
enraged von Rundstedt now poured every available resource into the battle, but the defenders of Bastogne would not give way. On December 26th, several of Patton's 4th Armored Division tanks battled their way into Bastogne. Although it was a precarious link-up at best, it signaled the relief of the city. Von Rundstedt's attacks continued until January 3rd, but the GIs defending Bastogne withstood every assault. The battling bastards of Bastogne had taken their place in the annals of great battles. At its deepest penetration, tanks of the 5th Panzer Army were only a few miles from the Meurs. But out of gas and short of ammunition, their drive shuddered to a halt. On December 23rd and 24th, Monteufel's troops were engaged by the 2nd Armored Division together with elements of the British 29th Brigade. The terrible fighting, often hand-to-hand, -hand, raged into the night. On Christmas Day, the Americans and British mounted an all-out counterattack, and the German line crumbled. Most of Monteufel's elite forces were killed or captured. Those who survived fell back in disorder. Hitler's armored onslaught had been destroyed. From that point on, his forces in the West were in retreat. On January 3rd, 1945, Bernard Montgomery began a long-awaited Allied counteroffensive, driving the Germans eastward gradually flattening their area of penetration. Having relieved Bastogne, Patton's tanks continued to push northward, their action keeping pressure on the southern shoulder of the collapsing German line. Gradually, Patton's and Montgomery's troops closed the gap between them. Finally, on January 16th, the two Allied armies linked up and together turned eastward in pursuit of the Germans. Hitler's once powerful army was squeezed into an ever-narrowing corridor in its frantic flight homeward. The Fuhrer had lost his great armored gamble. The disaster in the Ardennes would pave the way to complete Allied victory. With Germany's armor almost totally expended in the failed Ardennes offensive, America's Sherman tanks ran wild. They poured into Germany by the roaring thousands to carve into pieces what remained of the thousand-year Reich. Less than six years after Hitler's panzers had run unstoppably through Europe, burning hulks of his once proud armored legions lighted the victory procession of the brazen chariots that had destroyed them. The war in Europe ended less than three months after Hitler's Ardennes disaster. Now, his terrible tigers would only be seen in battle memorials.